Well, I'm Keith Edmiston. I'm a professor in the Crop and Soil Sciences Department at North Carolina State University. I'm going to talk to you about the first 20 years of GMO cotton production. Uh, and sometimes it seems like we've had some, some rough seas uh, in this adventure when, in the first 20 years. In fact, sometimes I've sort of felt like this guy. Well, won't the farmers let me protect them from Monsanto? Don't they know that I know what's best for them? So the first product that we actually uh, encountered, uh, first biotechnology product in cotton, uh, was BXN cut, cotton. Uh, and that uh, suffered from low yield potential and poor fiber quality. Uh, but those could have been overcome with new varieties. Um, but what really killed this technology, it was a herbicide uh, re resistance technology. The cotton was resistant to a herbicide called buckterol, which is a corn herbicide in the Midwest, is it had a li very limited weed spectrum. It did not control some of our major weeds in, in the south. Um, the next thing that we saw was uh, BT cotton. And on the left, you see BT cotton. And on the right, you see conventional cotton. And neither cotton received any foliar insect uh, insecticide application. So this was pretty exciting to see. Um, However, uh, a couple entomologists at NC State, J.R. Bradley and John Van Dyne, looked at some, uh, some conditions that were very favorable to bollworms and found that bollworms could make it to this technology in certain situations. And in fact, we saw that they could. And one of the reasons was that the, uh, the expression of this toxin, the BT toxin, was not as high in the bloom tags and in some environmental situations the bloom tags will stick on the bowl and if the moths lay eggs on those bloom tags they could get large enough feeding on the bloom tags that they could move down and damage the, the bowl. So the companies responded with, uh, with uh, varieties that had two and now three uh, BT genes uh, that improved the control of bowl worms and and some other and some other insects and the first bt was exceptionally good on tobacco budworm and european corn borers one thing that you never hear anybody talk about is just what peace of mind this gave the grower so the grower often in july and august he's sitting and his scout tells him or his consultant tells him that he needs a spray uh, that he's reached a threshold for bollworms or budworms and they're calling for storms uh, afternoon thunderstorm. That's very common for us. Uh, and he's hesitant to want to put that money out there and just see it washed off. So this, there's a certain peace of mind because this technology is already in the plant. It's not dependent on being able to get it out. It's not dependent on, in, on the weather. Um, so that's very valuable, I think, to a grower. Now, we, when we remove the pesticide applications uh, for bollworms and budworms, primarily, um, we did find that there were some secondary insects that we had never been all that concerned about, at least in North Carolina, on cotton. And that was stink bugs and, to a lesser extent, plant bugs. Uh, so in the absence of these foliar applications, they became a, a, a problem in some fields. So in general, we went from three applications for worms uh, down to one application, an average, we're talking averages of, of one application for these secondary uh, insects. And for the entomologists, that created a, a, a need to develop thresholds for these stink bugs because they had been inadvertently controlled with insecticide applications for bollworms and budworms in the past. We have a new technology that's in the pipeline that our entomologists are looking at that looks very, uh, very promising, and it controls the plant bugs. And one of the things our, our entomologists have also noticed is that it controls one of our, our number one early season insect uh, problem, and that's thrips. So we're looking forward to that technology coming on the market in the next couple of years. But definitely, uh, uh, genetically engineered cotton has decreased insecticide applications in cotton. Uh, we did notice when Roundup Ready 
cotton came out and Roundup Ready is resistant to a herbicide uh, to, uh, to Roundup or glyphosate. It's off patent, so there are numerous names for, the, for glyphosate, but everybody refers to it as Roundup. You see in this field that triangle is an area where the farmer uh, missed applying. Um, when he was applying Roundup, he missed that triangle. And as you can see, he probably wishes he missed the whole field. Um, and we saw that in other fields in the state. In this particular one, you don't see hardly any fruit on the plant until about the 14th node. And usually we're making most of our cotton uh, below the 14th node on the lower and middle portions of the plant. So we started looking at that, and this is a study in the Phytotron. On the left, you have untreated cotton. It is a Roundup Ready Bogard variety. And then in the, in the uh, middle is the same variety with one application Roundup. On the right is the same variety with two applications Roundup. And, of course, we've removed the leaves here, but you can see the reduction in fruit with the Roundup applications. So when we look at that, trying, trying to find out why that's happening, one of the things we saw was the, this enzyme that confers glyphosate resistant uh, was at lower levels in some of the floral parts, particularly the, ma the male floral parts. Um, and when we looked at those uh, pollen, actually, uh, on the left you see pollen from a non-treated plant, and on the right from a treated plant, and you can see that, that where the treated pollen is, uh, where it's had glyphosate, it's, it's not round like it is on the left, it's flattened. And actually when we tested those pollen, their viability in sucrose solutions, we saw that their viability was uh, dramatically reduced. So we had a physiological problem going on. And also, as you see on the bottom, on the left is a normal flower that hasn't been treated with Roundup. And on the right, you see a, a flower from a Roundup treated plot. And you can see that the stigma, uh, I mean, the, the anthers are, are stunted and that the pollen is, for the most part, being deposited on the middle of the stigma instead of the tip of the stigma where the stigma is receptive. Uh, that problem, we had that problem for a couple of years. It was worse in some fields than others. Uh, but that problem was solved also by the industry with new, uh, new uh, products that increased the, the uh, expression of the gene in the male floral parts. We did see initially some reductions in yield. Uh, 97 is about when we started having significant, a lot of acreage of Roundup Ready cotton. Uh, and that lasted for about three years. And then our yield started going back up again. And if you looked at it today, you would see that our our genetically engineered varieties actually out yield the any con conventional varieties that are available now. So we call that a yield drag, and that was a problem also in soybeans initially. So all these issues that I've talked about so far, the pollination problems, the bollworm control, the yield drag were addressed, improved with, with improved technology and, and new GE varieties, or genetically engineered varieties. So why did the farmers make it through that initial, uh, some of those initial problems. One of the things I think you have to realize is how difficult weed control was prior to Roundup Ready Cotton. And on the left there you see uh, a farmer post directing uh, and that means he's spraying underneath the terminals of those cotton plants and trying to cover the weeds. If he gets it on the terminals he'll, he can kill the cotton uh, but he's got to cover the weeds they're coming up in the row. And that's a very difficult process. Uh, cotton doesn't come up even sometimes. Uh, you have to go very slow because these things are bouncing in the field. So you're going two to three miles an hour. Uh, you're talking about four, six, or eight row units at the biggest. Uh, so it's a very tedious, time consuming process. Uh, and then later on, you see on the bottom left there, um, the farmer would have to continue with a, at least one, usually two more post-direct applications uh, and would go with about th at least three cultivations where he's cultivating weeds in the middle and throwing dirt up under the cotton trying to cover up weeds that are coming up in the row. Now 
look at on the right, you can see what Roundup allowed him to do. He gets rid of that post direct rig and that cultivator, and instead of covering four, six, or eight rows at the most, he can cover as many as 30 rows. And instead of going two to three miles an hour, he can go 12 to 15 miles an hour. So that's just just unbelievably important or uh, attractive to a grower. Uh, he's going to have to need less labor, and it's harder and harder for farmers to find good labor. He can do, do things a lot quicker. Uh, that means he might be able to go to one of his kids' ball games uh, one afternoon or uh, eat supper with his family or maybe even go to the, to the lake or the beach with his family for a weekend. Um, the other thing we saw without the need for cultivation is that growers quickly adapted reduced tillage systems. As you see on the top left there, uh, no-till cotton. And on the bottom right there, you can see what can happen in, in our fields in North Carolina uh, with erosion and conventional systems. There's been a lot of talk about super weeds, and this is Palmer amaranth. Uh, but I think it's important to keep in mind that weed resistance has been around for a long time and prior to GMOs nobody seemed concerned about them. Nobody in the in the media called them super weeds. Um, but you see the bottom right part of this graph that sort of dark blue line where it says glycines that's the Roundup uh, the weeds that are resistant to Roundup. And they started in the mid 90s when we started using the technology. But you can see prior to the mid 90s that we had weed resistance. Uh, so it was something that we had been dealing with in agriculture and not just in weeds, uh, with insect control and, uh, and disease control, much like the public deals with antibiotic resistance. Another thing I think is interesting is that there's a lot of furor around uh, weed resistance and GMO. Uh, usage is particularly with herbicide resistance uh, and this is another herbicide resistant technology called Clearfield technology but it was created with mutation breeding instead of uh, any uh, recombinant DNA techniques or biotechnology uh, because it's, it didn't use uh, biotechnology uh, this product can be sold in countries where GMOs are not allowed um, it doesn't have to go through the regulatory process. So you can develop it, you can start selling it, and you've got a large market for it. But it has the same potential problems that we have in any system that we can get weed resistance uh, or so-called super weeds. Or that we could have gene flow into the, to the environment. But nobody seems concerned uh, about uh, uh, some of these other breeding techniques. The other big concern you hear about is that, we, that uh, Roundup Ready Cotton uh, has led to inc uh, tremendous increase in herbicide usage and on the left graph there you see uh, what supposedly is a 500,000 pound increase in, in herbicide usage. Well what they don't, don't tell you about in that graph is that acreage went up tremendously during that period uh, due to high commodity prices and conversion of land out of uh, uh, out of conservation program. If you look in the middle graph, the pounds of herbicide used per acre for corn, soy, and cotton on average uh, really didn't change much. Uh, and the same data that's missing there uh, in, in those white areas is missing on the in this what they made the slide on the left too they just uh, extrapolated across those years so the pounds per acre it's interesting to look at the pounds of uh, herbicide per acre used on wheat because it's not a genetically engineered crop there's no commercially uh, available genetically engineered wheat but it actually has gone up uh, during that same time period so one of the things uh, the that the companies have come up with to help deal with uh, herbicide resistance is putting multiple modes of herbicide resistance into the varieties uh, to make them resistant to things like Liberty herbicide, 2,4-D, Dicamba. Uh, some of these products are, are already available and some 
uh, are uh, uh, have not been approved, uh, but the varieties are ready to go as soon as the technology is approved. One of the things you never hear mentioned, or I never hear mentioned, is the effect that uh, genetic engineering has had on chemistry discovery, which is probably uh, uh, of interest to, to uh, this group. And you can see there at the, at the introduction of glyphosate resistant crops in 1996, um, that after that happened, you see the herbicide discovery uh, that in, as uh, the number of U.S. herbicide patents declined sharply. And this is particularly uh, disturbing to me because, uh, as, uh, as probably you know, our pesticides in the United States since the 60s have continually improved in terms of their toxicity, lower toxicity, uh, less persistent, and just their environmental uh, impact overall. So it's, it's disturbing to me to see such a reduction in, in herbicide discovery. Uh, probably not the same amount of, uh, of decrease in insecticides and fungicides as there has been in herbicides. So this is a question I get a lot. All the traits we've talked about are aimed at the uh, producer, at increasing production, and not to the public or in terms of health benefits or anything that the, the public could directly perceive as a benefit. Um, and I think the reason for that is farmers are willing to pay for the technology and, and the companies don't even know if consumers will accept the technology, much less uh, be willing to pay, uh, pay for the technology and increased nutritional benefits would constitute a material difference and would have to be labeled. This is a site that we've developed um, to uh, provide information on biotechnology in agriculture uh, to our to the public. Uh, feel free to to visit our site and make any suggestions. And the last thing I'd like to say is is what we've seen in cotton is that this is not a silver bullet, but it has improved. Uh, um, I think every grower would tell you that it has improved things for them. And it really annoys me when people sometimes in the media act like farmers are being duped into buying this technology, that they're being coerced. You don't dupe or coerce uh, farmers into anything. They, they make decisions uh, very independently. So I hope you have a good conference and, and thanks for listening.